uh, currently, <clears throat> I would say probably still in the process. I mean, that's the first thing. Understanding what's, uh, what's going on in the country now, you know. I mean, you could be, you could be so good. I mean, you could be a first-class grad. I mean, you could be articulate, smart, and everything. But best believe there are a million other people out there who can, you know, who can probably do the same things you do. So it's trying to find how to stand out. Stand out to employers, you know, make them want you, make them want to employ you, you know, that's one thing. Uh, understanding the politics that goes on within companies, uh, sorry to say. Uh, basically, man, no man, you know. And then you think on the flip side, uh, people like Neymar earning how many thousand pounds a month, you know, from playing football, and you're here, you're really looking for a nine to five, man. You're like, God, please, you know. So it's, it's not easy. Uh, loads of aptitude tests, uh, loads of interviews here and there, you know, waiting on them. Some don't get back, some get back. Uh, at the same time, trying to build skills, you know, trying to learn new stuff, you know, trying to see, you know, maybe, uh, maybe there's some things you could do beyond, you know, the basic 9 to 5, applying your degree and all. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you wonder, like, how, 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 do you, how do they expect you, you to have that? Student? Okay, firstly, I mean, my LinkedIn profile, it's quite good. I mean, you should take a look at it when you can. Uh, you, you need to update that. You need to talk to people. Uh, definitely networking. You know, I mean, I've met so many awesome people during the course of my NYSC. You know, so I tend to always keep in touch. You know, tend to always try and build relationships. Uh, those relationships have really helped me in recent times. You know, I can tell you that uh, there was an, like an application yesterday now, where I needed, I needed an employee to send in my CV for the job. That was the criteria. You know, it was an in-house thing, and I had like six or seven people who were willing to send my CVs for the same company. You know, and. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciated the relationships I built, uh, I built over time, you know. Also building skills, you know, having some things to put on your CV, you know, that you can defend. You know, it's, 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 it's that, you know, and always be willing to go the extra mile. Always being keen on the applications, you know, always knowing when they come out. Always being there first, not necessarily first to apply. Apply on time, you know, putting your best in the application, hope to get in. But then even yeah. still doing all <clears> things, it's still in the still a bit difficult, you know, I mean, uh, there was a time where FIRS, for instance, had like, had 500 job openings, you know, and then over 700,000 people applied in this country. And, you know, we're, we're talking over 50,000 were first class graduates, you know, so first class, first class, you know, you know, still carry with like that, so. They need to pick. Exactly. Who are they going to pick, you know? I mean, uh, he, He's a graduate too. I mean, he can tell you, you know, he's interning at Accelerate. He's one of the lucky ones. You know, people like me are not as lucky yet, you know, but then, yes, we're hopeful. We're hopeful. I just got back from Guinea for my friend's wedding. That was, and they were, like, my friend called me on Thursday, for think of August, that there was some job workshop or ambassadorial training at Access Bank, the head office. That's how fast can I get there? She woke me up from sleep for like 3.50. She said, oh, we're starting by 4. How fast can you get there? So before I could even shower, I even come out, I even dress up. It was already like 4.30. So I called the Uber and I get there. Got there late, got there like 6. So I actually got there when they swung up everything. So, you know, I'm, my name wasn't even on the guest list because her friend was working at the head office. So she informed her and she informed me. So upon getting there, getting up to the conference room, <laughs> To be very sincere, it wasn't even what I expected. Like, it was just like a seminar, trying to get ideas from young people and all that. So, out of the blue, someone just spoke about internship. If they could, if actually could set up some internship platform. And honestly speaking, I've never met Mrs. Collette then. And she was sitting next to the table. I was sitting with my friends. And out of the blue, I just said the room kids. I didn't even speak up loud. I didn't even shout. Like I was just talking to my friends and she overheard what I said and she was like, ah, what do you see? What do you see? So because upon getting there, me and my friends were already laughing. Yet so the host, Oscar, comes to the mic and says, Yes, you've been laughing yet since we wanted to talk because people were not really expressing themselves at that seminar. So, you know, she was not like, like I, I believe that they expected me not to say what I said again. Then I take the mic, having nothing to lose, saying that nobody gets any job by merit or credit. It's by man, no man, exactly what he said. Because when he said that, I shook my head because I was like, wow. That's, exact, that's like the exact same thing I said with the mic on. You get So upon saying that, 
Colette at the GM, they were on the next table. She spoke, claiming me that, oh, that's not how they do it in Access Bank. That, yeah, accelerate staff, they, they pick this person randomly, that person randomly, cool. Yeah. Oscar, he works there too, he spoke. You know, like about three people spoke. So when they now asked me that, oh, that don't drop back the mic, that we still want to hear from you, like you feel very opinionated. So I said that I should give them something on social media. So I was now bringing up a concept for how they can improve their brand through Snapchat because they're on every other social media platform. Mm -hmm. So Snapchat. right okay. there, college just stops me and okay. offers me an internship in front of everybody. Right there and then. She just asked, how would you like to work with Access Bank? No, 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 don't even say anything. You have an idea about Snapchat, you go to social media. How do you want to work with it? Like, how would you like to work with Access TV, with Access Bank? I'm like, wow, just like that. Because, like, I was never meant to be there. So if you say lucky, yes, I'll say lucky. But worth it, definitely worth it for me. When she said that, you think she was lying? Like, yes, I did, because it took them. <laughs> I actually wanted to do the answer you answered. Yeah. Yo, oh, yeah, <laughs> you answer, replied oh, to her, yeah. I didn't, I didn't say anything. I just wanted the microphone to know that if it was real or not. <laughs> Everybody was shouting, yes, my friend, I remember, yes. Because, uh, okay, I'm like, okay, because they had to answer for me. I didn't just want to just jump up, like, oh, he's so eager and all that. Was he said, and you have to be Shakara small. <laughs> <laughs> I started this job like four years back, and from Ajegule. So, Tell about life in Ajegule. Life in Ajegule, and that's been very, very tough, but just that. And what I mean about life is tough in Ajegule, it's, and living in Ajegule, it's not that easy, and it's all about yourself deciding on a particular thing you want to do. Because so many, out, so many people out there, they don't really want to do anything. They just want to steal from those ones that, that are working. You understand? So that's it's one of the lifestyle there. I Is there a safety issue? It's not safe at all. It's not. But then, so if it's not safe in Nigeria, I'm, I'm asking just purely just for knowledge sake. Okay. Then why, like for instance, why would you still live in Nigeria? Uh, I still live in Nigeria because I was born and brought up there, so I already know how the corners of the jungle. So I, Call I the know. Jungle. Yeah, it's a jungle. I, I know how to succeed and I know how to escape it when it comes to things like that. So that's the reason why I still live in Ajigula. And I still believe that me, myself, staying in Ajigula, I can still make out the best from that place. I don't really believe maybe if you're from Ajigula, you cannot become what you really want to be in life. But it all depends on you and the dream you have and the focus you have. Some of my friends, they always tell me, ah, this one you open your shop in Ajigula, do you think you can make money from this place? I always tell them that no matter any area you find yourself, and you're doing a particular business there, all you just have to, you just have to trust in God first and believe in yourself. And just see it like, whenever place you're doing your business, when you're giving out the best, people will come and look for you from different places. Though I wasn't having it in mind that I'm going to be an air stylist. Then I, I started from this um, welding work, then after I didn't do metal job, so it was too hard for me. So though one day I was passing by, then I saw guys like my type, they were learning how to make hair. Then I decided that maybe I could just join these people and see what I can do from this. So when I joined them, I was just trying to struggle for myself because I know if I don't, nobody will. But at the end of the day, after learning and passing through those process, and then it was about 20,000 Naira, that was for four years back. So I, when I paid and I decided to learn, but the learning, learning of any job is not really easy because first of all, you have to pass through so many things, through operations and the rest of the things. But at the end of the day, you just have a dream and you really have what you want to do in your own mind, you understand? So after me myself learning, I, I decided to work on that salon. So after working on that salon, like, for six months. I worked under another salon like for one year. Then after the, that one year, six months, I decided to start from somewhere. Though my, my beginning was not that sweet. So it was very, very rough. Why did you say that? It, it was not that sweet because um, I started very small, very little. But what I just see in life is that you, you don't really need to. But were you 
were you proud that this is my own? I was very, very proud because I know where I'm heading to. I already have a vision that if I should start from this place on a very good day, I will be more than this. And that is what is happening. Then when I started from that shop, then within some years, I have to collect another shop. Then now I collected another one, so I'm having like three salons in Ajegule that I'm controlling. So then it was very, very hard for me, but at least now it's, it's not that hard at all. Uh, when I said hard, and everybody know how hard it is in this country, so when we talk about hard, everybody understand the, the language hard. And starting a particular business, you know it's not really going to be easy. Because first of all, you start convincing people that I can do this, I can do that. So buying people's mind is not really easy. So by the time you confuse this person, confuse this person, before you know, this person will confuse this person, and before you know, you pull a lot of crowd. What about your family? Um, though I lost my dad like three years back, then I, my mom is with me and my kid brother, but he's not here in Nigeria, he's in China, and my kid sister. I was very close to my dad, and when I was growing up in Ajegule, as in I don't really have that chance like to mingle up or associate myself with other people there. My dad always wants me to be inside because he, he, has, he has been there before me, so he really knows how it is that if he refused holding me very tight, that maybe at the end of the day I would just have to join the gang out there. So he was holding me very tight. So though, when I started having my freedom is when I lost my dad. I, I feel very bad that. He, he didn't live to experience those things. But at the end of the day, my mom is around to experience those things. So whereby my mom is enjoying it, I believe that he himself is enjoying it. Well, um, I'm a student. I'm schooling. I'm still schooling at Open mm -hmm. University. And I'm equally working as a supervisor. I mean, life has been very difficult, you know. You know. Back then, not even back then, up to now, some of our parents back then East, they believe that life is all about after secondary school, going to trade, you know, stuff like that. But they didn't know that. Most of them didn't know that education is the key. You understand? So after secondary school, you know, I went into trade. At a point, I, I decided to travel out of the country. So I got to Malaysia. I, when I got to Malaysia, the guy I met at the airport, he was actually a drug dealer. So I, you know, that was my first time. And, I decided to make a friend. We, we worked together, we sat together, we, you know, we started exchanging life stories. So at a point, the uh, alarm or something started blowing. So, and that was my first time. So I didn't even know the thing was actually against us. So for me to look back, uh, we have already been surrounded with military men, stand up, this, this. So I was, I was even laughing. So when I, when I now understand, when I was, when I now looked at the guy, the guy said I should calm down. So when they now handcuff us, so the guy start begging that they should let me go that I don't have any business with him, that he, he just met me here in the airport. So at the end of the story, they put us in their jail. I spent like seven months there. I mean, it was so hell. Uh, nobody knows now, as in, you're in jail. Um, even as if most of my family, they are not even aware that I'm traveling. It's only my dad and my, our last, our last born. So I, we, we spent seven months there. The week that will make it eight months, that was the week they, they said they would take us to court. And when we are going to the court, they were already explained to us that that court is death sentence, that we should not even think of we are going to be free. One thing about crime, even if you are guilty or not, when you know going to a prison a cell is another world altogether. When you get there newly, you will be scared, you'll be afraid, you'll be crying, you know, stuff like that. But when you spend like one week, two weeks, you get to understand that life is all about destiny, as in maybe this is how God wants to end it for me. So I was not really afraid, seriously. You're not afraid I, that you might kill no, me. I was not. I was even laughing. Uh, the the guy, the the military guy that was I was sitting beside her. I, I, I think they sent the guy, you know, these, they are very intelligent. They sent like two ladies. They were there sympathizing with us. That we, they are very sorry that whatever we are going to face, that's how they do it here, uh, these days. I think that I was, I was even telling them that they were asking, oh, do you smoke? I said, no, I don't smoke. I want to drink very well. They gave me the drink. I drink very well. I was very, I was happy. So when we got there, so, 
the judge, the lady, the woman they said she's the judge. She just came there, signed paper. She just, she, as she finished the paper, she, did, she just do her hand like this. No question. She went inside the, she went inside the room. So as we were there, they removed the handcuff. They say we should express ourselves to people around there. So I now look at, I now look at, there's one man, I think that man is from US. The man was standing, the man was, the man was as if he, was, he wanted to cry. I was looking at, what is your problem? Why are you crying for me? So I now woke up to the man, I said, sorry, sir, can I talk? They say, yeah, talk to me, what is it? What, why do you do this? They say, actually, I'm, I'm not guilty. Seriously, this is the guy that committed the crime, and he's even telling them I'm not guilty. They still don't want to listen to him. The, guys, the, the white man says, are you serious? I say, yes, I'm serious. So he now went straight to the same room, the woman that signed our paper and did that. He now went to say, the, so the next thing, the woman just came out, who is Ugoja and I'm the one, can you come please? They took me to a room, they interviewed me. After this, they said I should wait outside. They called the guy himself. They took the guy to the room. They interviewed the guy. So they now say, I should, the place they asked, they said I should wait. I was there when they finally handcuffed the guy again, as in the handcuff now, that is now <laughs> serious. So when the guy, the guy now begged them to tell me something. He said, he say, the guy now tell me where he is from in Enugu State, that in case if, I, if I'm opportune to go back to Nigeria, that I should please go and tell his family that he's no more, something like that. So that was when I start feeling the pain, knowing that this guy is actually going to meet his last hour, something like that. So, but I didn't go share. So I was only, you know, and when they took him, they entered the car, I, I, I sat there like three hours, so some guys now came, they started shaking me, congratulations, thank God for your life, you know. Some, they are, most of them are, I think one, two of them is Malaysian police and one U.S. police. So they, the U.S. police was one congratulating me, congratulations, thank God that I didn't end up this way. So they started telling me that, but they are sorry, that even though I'm not guilty, but they can't return me in their country, that I should go back to my country. I said, no problem. I was not happy knowing the fact that I came here to struggle like my other guys. I ended up in a, in a cell or like call it a prison where they remind us. So te now telling me that I'm going back to Nigeria, you know, mix the two stuffs together. I will, I will, let me say I'm happy. In the other side, I'm not happy. So that is it. They have to, they, I, I went there with Qatar Airway. So we waited like three days, Katai way, they say Katai way had issues with, with them, so they didn't come. So they now have to transfer me to Emirates, which they did, they pay me themselves. So when they transfer me there, I, did, I didn't even know that I already sent message to Mota Airport, Mota Airport, that I was arrested for drug case. Have you seen it? I came to Lagos, I spent another one month and three days at Krikri. <laughs> <laughs> One thing about this country is that, you know, when you are not, when you, when you are not from a rich home, I mean, when you are not from a rich home, you don't have say, no matter, even if you are guilty, you are not guilty, you are free, you are not free, you are not from a rich home, as nobody, nobody, nobody knows, and nobody can come out, nobody can come out to stand for you at that moment, you understand? I mean, standing for you, yes, you can get a lawyer. You can get a, a lawyer, then I can get a lawyer. The lawyer will get what he or she will need from me is money. And when he, when he sees the money bigger than the one I offer him, he will betray. So stuff like that. So when I go, when they, from airport, the military will land, they call me out, they interview me, what happened, I told them. The, the lady, the woman that arrested me even told me that she know, that she knows that yes, I'm not guilty of what they charged me, but she's, Thanking God that they didn't as they didn't kill me with the guy, so that was now that was now I now know that the guy is finally dead. Have you seen it? So when we, when we got to Krikri, the woman started showing me the guy's picture. They covered the guy with black stuff. They push him inside a river. So they push him inside a river. So that's how they execute the guy. So something like that. So staying there, I stayed there. I was there in Krikri like let me say months. So that month, they say nobody should come from my family. They were feeding me well. I was not sleeping inside their, I was not sleeping inside their cell or prison or whatever I call it. In the night, I would stay there. Immediately, it's 5.36. They would bring me out, take me to a room. I would sleep. 
in the morning, 10, 11, they will take me back to the time they now sign the paper that I should go. You know, living there, I can't go back to East. You understand? So I have to. Why can't you go back to East? I mean, you know, when you, you know, Easterners have this faith that when you travel out of East, everybody, even if, even if it's not everybody, the few people that know you are traveling out of the country. Especially so for you to now come back unexpectedly and you came back, you are, you are not coming back with your mind, you came back deported or something like that. So that is the biggest shock and shame. So it's better you stay somewhere, like, you know, you stay. So I wanted to go back, I wanted to go to Ghana, because I have somebody in Ghana. I just said, let me stay back here in Lagos. So, you know, coming back to Lagos is starting from zero. You understand? Sleep in the streets, wake up in the streets, hustle in the streets, try and get a job, no job then, have to do some linear jobs to survive, you know, stuff like that. And my dad, he's a retired soldier, so, you know, my dad don't, he have, he's a man that has strong hearts. Upon that, he still tell me that I should don't, I should not worry, that I will, I will survive. He's not, you know, some parents will tell you, come back, don't, this, this, but my dad is still telling me that I should not worry. You know, I know my father to be so, uh, to be a very, as in a man that he believes so much in God. He believes that even if, when there is nothing, you have God. So, uh, because when I, when I came back, I told my father what I passed through in Malaysia. He said he knew, that he knows. That all these, all these people that was in Malaysia, I know Eastern, all these are parents. He said he knows that I'm in cell, that he knows, that they were actually praying for me, this, this, that, that. And he said the, that very day, they released me, that a woman told him that he should not worry, that I will come back. That very day. So he said the woman told, her, told him that that very day, as you know, that I will come back, that God will bring me back. That I'm not in a safe hand there, that I'm in trouble. But that trouble, God will see me through. So something like that. But the woman is late now. So, so when I now finally back down to here in Lagos, you know, he was telling me that I should not worry. That I should keep working. I should keep, strong, keep trying. That one day God will surely make a way for me. Something like that. So it was really difficult, I mean, but to that, thank God, I'm back to school, I'm working, and uh, I'm catching for myself. My younger brother, he just finished his service, yes, um, they had the last badge, I'm the one that trained him. So after him, I, I'm now back to school my, my own myself, so. Even with everything and how difficult life is for yeah. you, you're still, you're trying to give the best opportunity to your younger brother. You know, when I came to Lagos, that is 2012, from Malaysia. When I came here, I started doing some linear jobs from there, and I realized I have to look for a job. Actually, I started with the security work, you know. I was doing two jobs at a time. One is security, one is, I was working with one lady at Lakey. I, mean, I started with her security too, but at the point she now said I should be her assistant, I should be in charge of the house. You understand? Everything, the house, everything in the house, the, to service the generator, to buy the diesel, to buy any stuff in the house, I should be in charge. You understand? So I will not call it a houseboy because I'm not cooking for her, I'm not sweeping for her, I'm not opening her gate, I'm just in charge of the house. As, let me say, as a, a technician, yes, understand? So she was paying me well then. So combined with the second work, I, I, rent my, I rented my first house, and that was when my Younger brother, my younger brother, will, let me say, we finished secondary school at the same time. So him too, he was, he was at <coughs> Portacourt, you understand, struggling the same, working hard on his own. So when I start making some money, I now say, okay, don't worry, come and seek for admission. At least let's start from somewhere. At least if you can go, if you can start with the money I'm earning, I can sponsor you in school. At least when, when you are half there, I can start my, you say, okay. So he came down to Lagos, he sat for jam, he made it um, at that state university. That's why I started training him. I didn't lower myself to that level of thinking only about myself. Because, yes, I might try, I might say, okay, after all, I'm not making the little money. Let me go back to school. Let me go back to school. Let me cut out for myself, build my life, you know, something like that. But I also have that thought that uh, what about if I get there, maybe something happen, uh, who will be like a backbone to me, something like that. So uh, since I have my younger brother, 
he's, he's equal intelligence, you understand? And he's always, he, he has, since right from birth, I've read the admission, he has the ambition, he wants to be an engineer. So since I have that, okay, he can start, he can start his own. Maybe when he's half done, almost going to his final, I can now apply for my, something like that. So I now decide, okay, let me call him so that he, he, was, he can go back to school Why I hustle here to make the money. What dreams do you have for yourself? Well, I can sing very well. I mean, when I mean very well, I can sing very well. I mean, there in Malaysia, I was, uh, why I didn't feel that anger or that pain or that misery, you know, agony, because I was entertaining the guys there. Nigerians are dying there. Nigerians are dying in Malaysia. I mean, we, we don't have to hide it. We are dying, especially, especially Yorubas, Igbos, they are dying there. In silence, you wouldn't know. You know, when, you, when a parent is here in Nigeria, his son is out there in Malaysia hustling uh, one year, two years, he didn't get any call from your son. You would think that maybe, probably he have changed his line or something, you know. But you didn't know he's already, he's already inside the belly of one animal and he's gone, something like that. So Nigerians are dying there. I mean, they are suffering. And the worst part of it is that when Malaysians, immediately they hear you are from Nigeria, I mean, they look at you, your country is rich. Your country is one of the richest countries in the world. I mean, what are people doing here if not to come and commit crime? They don't believe that you are coming there to, to hustle on your own to make something. They believe that you are coming to Malaysia to, as in, to spoil their country. You understand? So they, don't be, they believe that we have the money. You understand? They believe that when you go there, they will ask you your PT, everything is with you, you have some cash with you, they will know, you are not suffering now, you have the money, so why are you here? So most of our Nigerians that go there under education, so they are the ones, they look at them that, okay, they, they have come here to study, but we that go under hustling, you understand, social visa, so they believe that we have come to spoil their country. What, when you went to Malaysia, what was the, the idea that you had to make money? Well, you know, traveling out, there is no specific, you don't know of any business you are going there to do. You understand? When, when you want to travel, um, in, in this class I am now, if I want to travel, my friends, my, the, some of my friends are still there, Malaysia, Indonesia, Qatar, they are doing good. At least they are riding one of the expensive cars, building houses. They won't tell you exactly the exact thing they are doing there, you understand? Uh, because you can't even ask them, what are you doing? Because whatever they are doing there is good. It doesn't really matter how, it doesn't really matter how you go about it. Whatever that brings a good outcome is good. That is life, that's how I believe it now. So they are doing well. So it doesn't, I, don't, I don't even bother to ask them, what are you really doing there? What, why, how are you making your money there? Because we have heard that there is no work in Malaysia, there is no business. So how are you people making all this money, coming back home, different cars, you know, doing some stuff like that. So I don't, I don't really have any agenda or this is what I'm going to do in Malaysia. All I know is that when I get there, something will come up to do. And with that, I can make something good for myself. So, Evan, do you agree with uh, uh, Rumi and Uche, and even also with Tony, that Lagos, especially trying to find your way as a young man in Lagos, is unfair? It's usually who knows who. Okay, um, from what they said, they all said the truth, basically, because um, in Lagos, like, I really connect to what Tony was saying. It is when you've experienced a certain life, you, you are open to a bigger picture you see a bigger picture, a better understanding of things. For example, for myself, I had uh, a fantastic childhood. You know, lovely parents, you know, sent me to school. My primary and secondary school education was fantastic, you know. I loved books, I loved reading. I was intelligent, I, I liked books, I studied for classes and everything. And I finished secondary school. <laughs> then I had to write jam for university, so let me just summarize this part. I did jam. I wrote jam like four times. I wrote posterior me like five times. Each time it was it was more frustrating. You get like uh, I think my, my first jam was in 2006. So I think that was the period they started doing post, post UME. 
So, um, so jam was not really the issue. The issue was posterior me. So, okay, I did, and then I wanted to read, uh, study mechanical engineering. So I wrote posterior me twice in IFE, as IFE OAE. I didn't meet up the cut of mark. I did twice in Uniben. I didn't meet up the cut of mark. So I was like, even if they are following me, let me go to my state, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you get. So I went to the other state and I, you know, I went there to write and still I didn't get admission. So I think the fifth time my dad was like, how far? Write jam, you do it again. I said, oh, no problem. So he gives me the money, pays for summer coaching. I took the money, spent it on something else. I can't remember. <laughs> All I know was I was going out for, lect for lectures, but I wasn't going because I, I was made up. I was like, no, I ain't going to write it again. So um, then I did, a, I did one training, a computer engineering training, then when I left secondary school. So um, then there were not much laptops then. It was just desktops, basically. So in the computer world, I found it very interesting. You know, it was different. It was new. And I enjoyed it. I was like, okay. So all the while, while I was supposed to go for coaching, I would go in, I would go into computer village, meet guys who knew about computers, just with them. And internet now made it easy. Anything I don't know, I just Google, YouTube, basically. So the world of computer just amazed me, and I just went from there. And with time, I started learning. I learned under someone. I had to beg him, you know, without pain. Basically, I begged him, he taught me some tips, and he was primitive in a way. He doesn't, what he knows, he doesn't try to improve. So I improved on what he knows, and from there, started getting individual jobs. Clients that came around, some of them preferred me to do their jobs. So I continued from that level. So from there, I saw that computer was going into a very big um, thing. Then NIT was doing a scholarship exam back then, and I, I applied, I wrote their exams, and it was like a scholarship. I said, okay. I said, I passed. I went. And when they brought the bill, they brought like 300K. I was like, excuse me. <laughs> you said scholarship. <laughs> I did 300K. So, but still, I told my dad about it. It was like, is this what I really want to do? I said, sure. So I, started and in NIT I learned the professionalism in IT, you know, basically what the street guys do different from the professionals. So I took that into play. So and uh, I focused on clients that needed IT services but are not willing to leave their comfort zone. So basically I did house to house office services, house services. So if you need me, I was everywhere here and there. I can be in Ikeja today, I can be in Yaba tomorrow. So I go basically to people, to clients, and I get the job done from there. Then most times what I do is, because they don't know me, they just basically, basically it's from referrals, from other people who I've done for. So what I do is I borrow cash, I do it for them. When I'm done, I present it to them and then they pay. So when they pay, I now have to return the cash I borrowed. So at this point, I had X my mind on school. Like I was like, literally, I don't care. <laughs> Education can just <laughs> chill. <laughs> but then I wanted to be more professional. You know, I needed to, I had to have a business name, you know, make it a business. And I saw the importance of school, you know, and I was like, okay. Then I decided to, since I was working now, I started to do a part-time schooling, so I applied part-time in Yaba Tech for an ND program. And doing that, I just, that opened me to a different world entirely. Meeting people in school, the way they think, you know, the exposure was now different. And from there, I now knew that truly education has a, a lot to do. It, it, refine, it defines you in a way, it defines your business, makes it more you know, professional, structural, so that so I, all the things I didn't take note then, 
you know, then I used to make money, but I couldn't really account for it because I, I had no proper bookkeeping. I was not, I would, money would come, I would not make profit, you know, I spent because I had, so I had no proper setting. I could not tell you my average earnings in a month. I could not tell you what I make in a year. I could not really, but I knew I was doing a business. I get clients and so from meeting people in school, you know, Yabatek is close to Unilag. Then I got to meet a friend in Unilag, a student there, though he's done you now. He liked the way I did one of his laptops. His laptop got bad and he said it could not work. And I was like, why would it work? So he brought it, I fixed it up. And he was like, wow, I have friends in school who, who, who have systems that have issues with what. I don't, I don't know if there will be a chance. Can you come to Unilag? I was like, ah, why not? That is my foundation. <laughs> so I went, I started going hostels to hostels, more me, New Hall, meet students, and I would pick up their stuff. And what I started with was when I, you know, I usually I borrow then to, so because of I've built myself to a level now, I now insisted on you pay at least 60% upfront. And that was a point you pay up from 100%, you know, because they had known me and they didn't know I'm going to, I was like, okay. So I decided to get an office, you know, register my business. Instead of doing a business, I did a limited company. I got someone to partner with me. And then I was done with ND. Then I went back for HND. I'm actually in my final year now in HND in Yaba Tech. But now, I, when I, Coming back for HND, I had to switch from, from part-time to full-time. And I, that was, that was like, I, then I was like, man, I was going to know I was going to do it. But starting it was crazy because doing full-time and part-time, is they are two different things entirely. Now I have to like prioritize the important classes, the one that I must attend. <laughs> if it's not too important, man. I just put it aside, you know. So, but the fact is, doing business on my own has really changed me. I would, like they say, they say every disappointment is a blessing in disguise. Um, looking at myself now, I would say if I had really gone into uh, mechanical engineering, if I had got ambition, I probably think I won't be fulfilled as I am right now, because computers to me, it's, 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 I, there was a time I used to do it for fun. Just, I just needed to work on it, you know? So for me, seeing computers now, as in moving into computers now, it's, I, I see it as a blessing because um, I've never had to apply for a job. If you ask me to write a CV for you now, I would tell you I have to go through my books and follow the procedure of how they will arrange a CV because I've never had to do it. And you know, working on your own gives you opportunity to meet different people, understand how people relate. It makes you more social, you know. And one thing I learned in my line is, you know, those who are into engineering, especially who run a service center, they fail to do what I call uh, customer feedback. You know, they, after you do a job for a customer, they don't go back to ask, how far, how has it been? Have you experienced any, any issue, you know? And clients, they enjoy stuff like that. They like the fact that you actually want to know how their experience is after you've worked for them. And some may actually have issues, and they may just write you and like, no, I'm not going to work with that guy again. When he did it, he did something. But the fact that you call to ask, they will be like, okay, you know, and the trust is rebuilt from that level. So um, for me now, I, I don't see myself looking for a job even after my HND. You understand? I just want to expand my level and learn from others who, are, who have gone far and see how I can improve myself and be better at it. I'm not actually having issues looking for a job. Um, luckily for me, my profession is actually a, um, a good one. It's a professional job. Um, we, optometrists, actually have this network that 
if I sit down here and he has an opening in his clinic, I will know and I'll connect the next person. So we kind of have a round table, really. But being an optometrist in Nigeria, hmm, that's another ball game entirely because uh, um, we find it difficult to move ahead. Um, partly because our body is not really doing well and also the ophthalmologists on one side, being the medical doctors on the other side, are really not making life easy for the non-medical students. So the nurses and all, the, all that people working in the hospital are all struggling. That's because they are the bosses. They've practically taken every corner of um, health management in all states, in every sector, in Nigeria as a whole. So they kind of pull the strings on who gets what and how they get what, you know. So if not for our own um, networking, uh, we really, really, really die. But, so you, <laughs> but, but thank God we're growing. How do you exist? How do you make money? Well, um, we, the upcoming optometrists, are not, we, we don't sit down these days and uh, follow what our old guys are doing. Most of us are going out of Nigeria. He made mention of Malaysia, Qatar, Canada, Australia. We're just going out. That's the latest, actually, in Nigeria. All of us are going out. I, I am actually, I have applied already to some, and I'm expecting some feedbacks. Do you feel sad that your own country cannot provide opportunities for you, that you have to go somewhere else to see them? Sad is actually not the, not the language. Anger is the language. Anger because, uh, you know, everything is already made for you to be someone in life. But you come out here and you see the market like a different ball game entirely. It's one thing to go to school and start struggling. <laughs> struggling in school is another thing. But then you come out, you expect to... I, I, remember, I remember when I did my, in, my um, induction to become a full doctor. My dad came and everybody was happy, you know, there was this joy. My son is not a doctor, my son is not a doctor. But then, <laughs> my own story is even good compared to others. I sit in my clinic and I, and I offer people many, many jobs. Many of my friends that have um, graduated, that's those older than me, they still call me, Bill, do you have any other thing? Do you have a place? And I'm like, um, not yet, not yet, not yet. And I call. Just two days ago, I actually, this morning, I sent someone a text. They need somebody there. Go. Because she has graduated for a year plus. She hasn't gotten a place, um, you see. So I just had to just let her go to the place. Besides, they needed an intern, which she hasn't done because there was no opportunity for her. So I just sent her there. So that's it. So anger is actually the word because we come out expectant, but then nothing, you see. Well, I, I, uh, he said something. Uh, in the East, you are being, you're actually being bred to be an entrepreneur. So the average man from the East wants to be an entrepreneur. He doesn't believe in working for anybody. And he also mentioned also that the, the mentality is wake up, make money. Not how you make money, make money. Um, Yes, Nigeria is like that. Everybody wants to be an entrepreneur. But if everybody is an entrepreneur, who is going to work for the entrepreneur?